it's an attempt to quantify everything is the best way. So giving value to everything we do in our program, everything that happens on the court, whether it's a loose ball, and a lot of people do it, but we, we really get down the details. Um, deflections worth something, a steal's worth something, an on-ball coverage is worth something, a blown negative if you're in the wrong place, um, and uh, a lot of passing stats, and, and basically our own internal efficiency rating based on what we believe will help us win. What is basketball? What is What is it? What is, it? Is, this, is this basketball? Is that basketball? What is it? What is basketball? Welcome back to episode seven of the Solving Basketball podcast. Today, we have our second head coach that we've had on the podcast. This time, he's been the head coach of San Francisco, the Dons, for this going into his third season, Coach Kyle Smith. Thank you so much for coming on, Coach. Uh, no, thanks for having me. I also have to thank Jonathan Sapphire for your director of basketball operations for setting this up. I, I'm not really sure what you see in them, him, though. Why do you keep hiring him? You know, he's entertainment. For first of all, he, a lot, a lot of synapses firing between those ears. Not, 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 not much direction, but a lot of, lot of activity. <laughs> so the first question I ask every guest on the podcast is: If we walked into a gym right now, and I went under the hoop, and you went to the foul line, and you rebounded for you a hundred free throws in a row, how many would you make? At this age, age forty nine. Yep. Somewhere between 75 and 79. 75 and 79, okay. I haven't done it so long, but I really, it's one thing you, you, you actually keep your shooting touch. One out of, everything else goes, but you can you still make a free throw, I feel. <laughs> right, right. And you played, you played D3 ball at Hamilton. I, I looked it up, 51% from three, the school record, right? Yes, I could shoot. Not much else. I could defend a little bit, but wasn't much to it. I could make, make a shot. Well, it's funny. I had the other head coach that we had on was Chris Jans, and he had almost the same profile as you. He played Division Three basketball, and he set the all-time record, I think, for threes in for in D three. So three point shooting it correlates with coaching, I guess. Did he go to Grinnell? He went to uh, Loris. Goodness, I, guess I figured someone at Grinnell had to have the all-time record, but anyway. Well, I, I'm sure it's been broken. I'm sure it's been broken, but at the time, it was it was the record. Yeah. Okay, fair. The first thing I want to start talking about is recruiting. You were just on another podcast called the Stat Chat Podcast, and you had a comparison about a recruit you had at St. Mary's that I wanted to bring up, Omar Samhan, who's kind of like a college basketball cult hero. You compared him yeah. to to like Moneyball um, and how he didn't really look the part. Billy Bean's famous line in Moneyball is, we're not trying to sell jeans. We're, just, we're trying to win baseball games. Um, so what was the story behind recruiting Sam Han? Uh, you, you made the mistake, an origin story. I can go right back to the beginning. Uh, well, uh, Omar was a guy that's probably about 30 minutes from our campus. Um, and so we kind of had a – someone had told us about him, didn't know a whole history. I go watch him as a junior, and he is – you know, a lot of those big kids can be really doughy and just sloppy as can be. He's probably – at that time, he's probably 6'9". 280 pounds and he's probably grown or whatever he's he's got he's got long arms or whatever and i go and see him and he he contributes zero points he actually got shut out in the game as a junior and uh but he had like 16 rebounds and randy asked me what'd you think i said well he didn't score <laughs> but there's some things that are, you know he's, he's got got a chance maybe yada 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 and that's Several. So goes out in the AU that summer, and he really looks like what I. You'd have to be my age. You'd have to watch a lot of Popeyes cartoons back in the day. Well, like one of those guys with like a sandwich board or like a barrel. He just looked like a guy who was in a barrel had these little legs sticking out. So he's just this horrible looking mess. I can say that because I love Omar. Uh, but he, that summer, and like the big guys in the AU stuff don't. They just basically run top of the key, top of the key, unless they're pros. The pros stand out that size. So anyway, he basically had very light recruitment going into his senior year. And uh, he wasn't a great student. I don't know if that's – but uh, whatever. I don't even think that factored in too much. But – and I think he had one offer going into the season. was Idaho. 
and he, but you know, and it was it was kind of crazy because there's another guy. There's an unbelievable factor in there. Is this guy named John Bryant, who was almost the same deal, but actually bigger, probably three thirty, six ten, and they're both coming out the same year. And I was, you know, Omar knows this, but I was kind of in the John Bryant camp, but I was kind of overruled. If we're going to take one of these freak shows, we're going to take. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I'm putting my ballot on this one. Neither one of them getting much recruitment. And we actually had two seven footers in the program. And our rule was we're not taking another big guy. And I was, we're both, we're all, all the whole staff. Lamont Smith was there, Randy Bennett. We were like, I think both these guys are good enough, but they weren't getting recruitment. It just takes those guys a while. And neither one of them looked, looked the part at all. They couldn't get up and down the court, yada, yada, yada. Both have great senior years. Santa Clara goes early, takes John Bryant. And uh, in late, and actually, Omar originally committed to San Francisco. He didn't get enough classes. They ended up not qualifying. And we we're lucky to have a scholarship available. And we kind of knew it, we, he produced. He had like 25 and 12 as a senior. And we're like, we just got to do this. And that's we just kind of were fortunate to have one open. He actually had to go to junior college for a semester to qualify and enroll that Christmas. So he looked funny. He had some great issues that he shouldn't have. It was just an oversight. And and he produced in those a kind of deal and he got in our program. So he kind of and that's and once he got in our program, he just we kind of knew he, he was willing to work. He had a great work ethic, and and within our system of stats and that he 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 was kind of incentivized by it and kind of shaped and his body's changed and everything and and he turned into like you said that cult hero and and it really didn't pay off till his big time. He's always pretty good as a young guy, but he's hard to win with. But his fourth and fifth year, he's probably his fifth year is probably the best center in the country, and his fourth year is really good. So um, that's kind of the story. I, he played in the basketball tournament TBT this summer, and he looked like he was in pretty good shape, actually. So I don't think I don't think he has that same body anymore. No, he's 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 ninety pounds less than when we had him. It's <laughs> amazing, and uh, he actually looks like a long, skinny four man now. Yep, that's funny, and that's kind of he's made a pro career. And, He's had he had a torn ACL when he was young, but uh, um, he has changed his whole his whole look, uh, and he's more skillful, and he's managed a, a pretty healthy career. But he was uh, definitely a fun uh, college player. Do you think that type of recruiting model, like finding the diamond in the rough, odd fit? Do you think that's a sustainable way to win um, at the at, in college basketball? I'm not sure. It's a great question. I've kind of built an entire career on it. <laughs> I guess, I mean, I, and I mean that like, and we won, we got to where we won pretty big at St. Mary's and it was partially that partially other things, but that was just kind of my, my niche was to always try to find, make that value pick or whatever. I, I um, and it's, it's more of a psychological thing. I don't like that. I, I like, and we like that, that we want guys where we're at, like this is their destination. Like I'm choosing a school. This is my, and basically your biggest offer. And just kind of the deal, but then trying to find value in a guy that's going to grow into that and become good, as opposed to going through the whole competition and begging and pleading and and trying to. We're, we want guys that are thankful where they're at, so I, I think that's part of the deal. So I, I think there are coaches that do it. To be honest, I think John Beeline is probably the best example. Uh, doesn't care on the rankings and gets the right guys that fit his program. Obviously, he's got Michigan in such a place where yeah five star guys want to jump in but I don't think that was always the case and he's willing I know he's willing because we were bumping heads when I was at Columbia he was recruiting like DJ Wilson he visited Columbia <laughs> Michigan uh that usually doesn't happen um Duncan Robinson you know obviously taking a division three transfer is amazing and we we turned him down originally at Columbia it was so crazy to try to get him you know without when he left D3 oh we'll be able to like what what Michigan what <laughs> what's that so uh, Tony Bennett uh, is another guy, and really specifically when he was at Washington State, some of the guys that they were taking were those odd-shaped, you know, Robbie Cowgill, 6'10", 190-pound center. Uh, Josh Akoyan, he, he was like a six-foot two-guard, still playing somewhere, still making baskets somewhere. And then, uh, ironically, Tony got rid of him, or he let him go after his sophomore year. He was their leading scorer, and they took off. It's just like... So I think those guys, we study pretty hard. Randy's obviously another example. Um, they just have their own criteria of what makes a player. And it, it, it does, sometimes it jives well with the recruiting services and ESPN 100, but there's other times where um, very specific to what they do, they'll be good. And I think Michigan's probably the one that we really, 
we just find that the the combo forwards, combo guards, skillfulness. That's what we try to we try to adapt ourselves to. It's interesting because New Mexico State historically, uh, the coaches have changed in the last three years, but they're they're kind of the opposite where we would get some guys who had high major offers, but it didn't work out for some reason. It was almost like the fallback option. Usually grades. Sure. Yes. <laughs> I, I don't, there's one that I think you might, you must've been there last year that I'm going to ask you how he's doing. Because I think he might be a pro is a kid out of Houston. This, this, I loved him. Uh, Jabari Rice, maybe. Yes. How good. Yeah, uh, he so he was a prop kid. Yeah. He couldn't practice with the team last year, but he was there. He can really score. He can really score. Yeah, I think he can pass too. Yeah, I think he. I think he's awesome. Yeah, that's a great example, though. Yeah. Yo, yeah. that's. A, I think that was the deal with. I think Utah State, New Mexico State have a couple advantages on those kids, right? Am mm-hmm. I wrong? Yeah. Where yep. Get, yep. So I think there's a there's a what do you say an efficiency in the market where they've capitalized on. Uh, being able to utilize that piece to in New Mexico State's ever will be good forever as long as they are able to do that. I think exactly. So yeah, it's it's a different inefficiency. Yeah. What about at St. Mary's? Has the Australian pipeline has that kind of been like an inefficiency when you were there? Yes, but you have to understand that I, I think they're also, and I also believe this, and it's a little coach centric. I think uh, if given the right support. And it's not financial necessarily. I think you just let guys work. I think coaching is really important. I think they're, it's a combination. They're finding inefficiencies. And I think uh, Randy's a coach's coach in that way. Like he's he's going to be good. He's going to be really good wherever he's at, I think, a little bit. He's just competitive that way. Um, in addition, I think the Australian thing was something they tapped into early. And then it became their brand. And uh, – Mm-hmm. and sticking with that brand so everyone found they found a niche there and uh and still riding it pretty hard um and uh same for us when we were at columbia uh i thought it was we you know i was there six years it took a while to figure out but the international piece was good for us and then i think we were starting to go down south actually made more sense for kids like around the atlanta area or even houston area florida area where um they not really going to feel New England, you know, like where Boston's the center of the universe, so, but they like New York, you know, and, and uh, some things like that. You have to be, explore what, 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 what makes your school unique. Do you think athletic directors consider this part of it, like the, the efficiency of recruiting and how the coach will relate when they're making their hire? No. <laughs> you <laughs> no. <laughs> I, uh, I interviewed 12 times. And I pitched the same thing, all 12. And I finally took Diane Murphy for the grace of God. Uh, and who knows what other, she, she, she kind of stopped halfway through the interview and said, yeah, this is what I'm looking for. Um, so I remember my first interview, I won't name the AD or school, but I felt like I did really well. And I, I'm still pretty confident I did pretty well. And I know I was speaking Spanish to them when I was talking about the, the metrics and talking about how we use the metrics in our practice. And we also use this in recruiting and it's just probably highly analytical, but I was like, he told me in my thank you note, my punctuation was bad. And I was like, <laughs> I, I do not want to work for this person, but I'm still, still mad. I didn't get it. But I was like, that's what, that was your offer of advice. And I, and he started telling me this. I said, you know what? I might've come off a little folksy or a little whatever, but I, I feel pretty confident that, you got a great picture of what it was going to be like to have Kyle Smith coaching your basketball team. So I, I don't, I don't have any apologies for it. And, and it's okay. It's the same as recruiting. It's like, I'm just not the right fit for what you're looking for. So, but I don't think, and I'm not saying they just, I just don't think, I think they're more ADs are influenced by agents and other higher profile people, alumni money, uh, their alums are writing checks. So they, I think that's what they're really influenced by. I don't know if none of, enough of them have enough courage to say, we're going with that guy because he's, he's an analytics guy. He's a this and that. It sounds popular now, but I think still, if, you know, a big name brand name program is endorsing that, I think that takes that AD off the hook. If no, I mean, if John Calipari saying, Hey, this guy's going to be the next such and such. I think that goes a lot further. Um, it just, 
and I understand. Like, I don't think the ADs, those are big decisions for them. They have to make them hopefully not that often. Um, and if they can, you know, not upset, rock the boat, I think that's just human nature. I think if they're not rocking the boat with alums, the people they report to, and you can sell it to the players in the program um, and that aren't necessarily the, the real grit, the detail, then I think they feel like their job's done and, and that's, that person works. So I, I do think, so when you say that, like, I think it takes a very skilled, shrewd, and there's not enough former coaches that are in the administration anymore. So I don't think, like I said, like you look at Randy Bennett's tree, he has some really, uh, take myself out of it, but, you know, like Ron Gannat won an NCAA tournament game in Hawaii. Uh, Rick Croy's done really well at Division Two at Cal Baptist. Um, David Patrick's now at UC Riverside. Lamont Smith did well at San Diego. Um, I don't know if I'm missing the others, but but I've had to kind of find different spots, like and for their amount of success. But I think it's all going to grow, and guys are going to, you know, those guys will do well, and that'll build next thing. But I don't think it's like, hey, there weren't necessarily people like beaten down hey you guys have been to whatever Randy's been to seven NCAA tournaments with Sweet 16 with limited resources um what's going on there that was never it was we we, we all learned we had to you know just do a good job and hustle for your opportunities whereas you know guys guys are assistant at Cal or Stanford or it, it sounds pretty and it's good I mean there, there's some value in that I haven't been there so I don't know but but I just you're, you're I think that's really attractive for an athletic director to hire someone off those staffs as opposed to like just really getting down like here's here's a half it's more the i really think that have same here's a, a bit of a have not resource wise compared to others so like how are they doing it you know i think it got more people fired in our league because st mary's was doing it with very little as opposed to like well maybe they're doing something like they're doing without this that but they're doing something so and i don't know if that enough ad's and there's some but like man they're pretty good well, it fits with what we've been talking about with inefficiencies. I guess it's an inefficiency in hiring. Then. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. There's, yeah, but I do think then there might be some things that are intrinsically better there that aren't necessarily money related. Last recruiting question before we switch gears with St. Mary's and Gonzaga in the conference currently at, at, with your job at San Francisco, did they affect your recruiting? Like knowing. Gonzaga is always going to have a couple of seven footers. It seems like and St. Mary's has a lot, a lot of bigs too. 100%. Unfortunately it's uh and don't, don't, don't exclude BYU. Um, yep. Cause uh, they have, like I said, their niche is pretty special. They have a growing faith where, where they love that every, every Mormon church has a, a basketball court there. So <laughs> they, you know, that that's a pretty unique one and a good one too. And a, a lot of resources and a, a facility that, has 21,000 people to fill the stand. So you're dealing with, and I think uh, in order of number of tournament appearances, it goes for coaches, Mark Few, one, Dave Rose, two, and then uh, Randy, three in those. And you know how much success they had. So you're dealing with three programs that all play different style, but a certain style. And uh, so our recruiting was his attempt to try to not get in their lane a little bit, if that makes sense. Like, so our style of play, the way we want to play is going to be different. So we'll be recruiting differently. Um, that's the goal. And because I'm like, Hey, they do a pretty good job recruiting and they're good coaches. So I, we could do a great job recruiting the same players, do a great job coaching and maybe not impact or move the needle there. If that makes sense. So mm -hmm. it, it is a, for sure, a calculated decision. Um, like I said, we've always kind of been in a situation where we did it at St. Mary's too with Randy. We changed the way we played, and he's changed another way. He, he's kind of morphed it too. Um, I think it's pretty set in the way he's playing now, and it takes well, you know, you recruit to it, and then you know, you'll recruit a certain way, and then you're like, well, we need more of this, and then you look at your team two years later, like, well, we got, oh, we overcompensated, we we have to change the way we're playing a little bit, but definitely the way we're, I think ours probably kicks in more next year what we've been recruiting to and been doing with uh, you know skillful guys maybe late bloomers that will impact as they get older so you mentioned style of play a little bit and that's what i want to get into next specifically on offense uh, so you've predominantly been a pretty princeton heavy 
offensive coach. So it's an, an offense that's lasted. So like the triangle offense takes a lot of criticism. Uh, whereas the Princeton offense is just as old, I guess, but it's still pretty prevalent in college basketball. So what about it has like translated to the modern game? I mean, you see it in the NBA. I mean, I laugh. I giggle when people, they love to use it against us in recruiting. They play Princeton. I'm like, well, that's what the NBA does. <laughs> I don't know if people remember the Sacramento Kings with Chris. Yep, Adelman. Lade and their and Toby and, and Pete Krill sitting on their bench and Adelman. They're just, they're a fun team to watch. And I think it's, uh, and really with it, and it's funny because the team we inherited, we were big on culture and they embraced it, but they weren't recruited really to play this style. So it's kind of bit, we've been fitting a square peg in a round hole, but it still, I think, gives us our best chance to win and ideas to find guys that can, we call them six tool guys, dribble, pass, drive, shoot, defend, and rebound. And they're hard to find. But, but especially in those offensive skills, being able to not have an, a certain proficiency in those offensive things is really valuable. And and like I said, we I've been preaching it and ends up, coach at Columbia here is that the three pointers were worth too much and the NBA's figured that out. And I think it's an ugly game to watch a little bit when the ball's just kind of casted up there all the time, but it makes sense. Um, and we probably run a little more stuff than others, but, but the floor with that, with the shooting and the skill, um, and really trying to create more abilities to get to the basket. Well, that's your most efficient way to score is to get to the foul line. Um, uh, and, you know, the Rockets obviously made a living off of it, and it's kind of gross the way they play, but they're just smart in the sense that, like, when James Harden gets fouled, he's an unguardable force, and he can really pass, so get out of his way. Um, so we have a guy like that. <laughs> we'll use him say, similarly, but, like, disguise it a little bit sometimes, but they don't even – they don't make any bones about it. They just say, we're, we're going this way. So um, it's just – and it's and anyone that's ever played in the offense, every, every decision – creates another decision and every decision you're you're able to score um so we're looking for guys that get that understand that and it takes a certain feel too but um and you don't always say you don't always know till they're here that that's the tricky part to really put them in the system of those decisions how many would you say are reads versus calls Mm. almost all reads 95 percent of reads um and i don't even know how coaches the coach and make a call every trip down the floor. Whenever I try to call something, the guys don't even hear me because because <laughs> they're not used to it. And, <laughs> and usually we've had, I think, I want to say, I think it's going to be just my ninth year. I think I've had eight straight years of an all league guard, and we really play out of his hand. And like like for this, like Ferrari was last year, and he came on. Um, we kind of call him Brett Favre because he's kind of a gunslinger out there, and he'll he'll see something, he'll call, he'll he'll, he'll roll with it. I'm like, that's better than anything I'm coming up with. That's how I said he's out there. He's had so many reps in practice and knows what we're doing. He can move pieces around um, and make plays. Sometimes he frustrates me, but I probably should be a little easier on him. I'm putting a lot of a lot of responsibility on him, um, and that's kind of how we play. We had Model Low and Grant Mullins at Columbia, and they were just as they got older, it's just. It's just get out of the way a little bit. You mentioned Frankie Ferrari. And to me, I, I haven't ever been a part of a coaching staff that ran Princeton. But to me, a ball-dominant, playmaking point guard is a little counterintuitive. We played against Air Force a couple times. And their point guards tend to not be high assist guys. But Ferrari was, was I think, top 50 in the country. What's that like in, in a Princeton system incorporating someone who's ball dominant like that? You know what? We stole a little bit from uh, 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 really we call it we've been trying to get a good name for it, interchange a ball or or the mesh, which is really half a lot of it's stolen from from us. It's really from my time at St. Mary's. Um, and that's where McConnell, Della Vadova, Patty Mills, Todd Golden, uh, Carl and you. So a lot that's a lot of it. And those guys are ball dominant. We we use a lot. So a lot of our starts are offense. A lot of our finishes are offense end up in the same thing that like uh, St. Mary's is doing. So that's why I'd say like the ball down the guard, not, not a problem for us. Um, we like it in St. Mary's. We have, we'd like to play the two point guards too. Um, if we can two two really good decision makers. So um, take some of that burden off them. But, uh, and also I like said, Richmond has been doing it with Chris Mooney has been doing it. Uh, mm-hmm. We had Kevin Anderson, and then he had Kendall. What's his name? Little guy. Whatever. He had another. He had 
and then he had another one. He's been he's and he's got another one now. So he's kind of and we he he influenced me a lot, and I watched him play a lot. And they do a lot of a lot of their stuff. I'm like, oh, that's what they do to put their their little guy in the middle ball screen and different different opportunities for them to really exploit their strengths. And um, so I'd say that it's we're going to play with the, with the hand we have. We got a good center. We're going to throw it to him every time. We're going to put our best try to get our best player the ball as much and get his usage up. Is the best way to describe it. Jonathan insisted that I bring up Isaac Cohen. So I watched some of the 2016 team that won the CIT and I saw you guys played him almost in like the five spot at times yeah. of where, where he was coming out into the action that gets you into the split cuts. Yeah. So is that an example of using what you have basically? Absolutely. And I wish I would have got to that a little quicker with Isaac. Um, Cause he's like a perfect basketball player with one big hole. He just wouldn't look to shoot. He wasn't a great shooter, but he had an unbelievable feel, a ridiculous passer, great rebounder, best defender, good sense, organized. He really played one through five. Um, so he's one. He's a five-tool guy with that sixth tool. If he just would have been able to uh, make a shot. So, like, since he didn't shoot it, we just put him at center because he could score in the post. He was good in there. And so if he went one-on-one in there, fine, shoot a layup, all good. And, and then he was such a good passer and playmaker, a little like Draymond, you know, but even more better ball handler. Um, and uh, those are those are hard to find. And then they really we give them, a, like I said, the five out spreads and the four out one in situations really make a guy like that a lot better players. It, it systems matter. Him running a floppy perimeter guy on the flop. He doesn't. He's no good. Mm-hmm. He's not any good. <laughs> but it, but in a four out, five out, post him, uh, he's he's really good, and and uh, and I I really didn't stumble into it. And I mean I kind of knew, but yeah, put time in. I should put more time into inverting him and putting him in the center spot. Um, it was really Princeton forced our hand because they had some really they had a really good team, and they would they'd throw five guards out there, but like the, their front line were like six five, six six, six six. Um, and they're really all guards and they're good, long enough, big enough to go- defend. And you, you couldn't guard them unless you put, you kind of had a matter what we felt. The only way you do that. So we started using, they didn't know what to do with Isaac and they start putting, and they would play one, six, 10 guy and they start guarding them. They just hit him in the paint. So I said, well, no, we're going to put Isaac in the low post and you get six, 10 guy. You're gonna have to guard him. And he couldn't. <laughs> so it was good. And then the, the other thing I noticed from watching your teams a little bit before the podcast was all the back doors. So even when you're in breakdowns, not necessarily pure pr- uh, Princeton, there's a ton of back doors going on. So I'm wondering, how do you how do you teach that? Is the default basically to go back door? Is it a read? It's a read. I think a lot of our warm ups and drill, and this is kind of stolen from Randy and I stole it from Vance Wahlberg, actually. Uh, who kind of changed the game in the early 2000s, in the 2000s, as far as like all the dribble drive stuff. Yep. Um, and like a lot of our four and four full court drills before practice, you get a lot of situations there. Um, and a lot of our penetration rules, which we work on a lot, uh, you're either coming to get the ball or going back door, which is simple, similar to what you'd, you'd call the Princeton action, but this is more off dribble drive stuff. Um, so I think it's good what we do and I owe a lot hat tip to Vance because uh, he just let us come down there and steal from him. Uh, and uh, then actually Calipari was sitting in the gym. This back was in Memphis too. And, and, and he stole the idea that he, I used to call it Princeton on crack. <laughs> so that was a little vulgar I guess, or inappropriate. And uh, he called it Princeton on steroids. And he had a little bigger platform than, than me as the associate head coach at St. Mary's, but but we're both kind of – it was revolutionary a little bit when we started playing two guards, spreading it out, and putting shooters down in the corners, and those guys really forcing the hand on those guys, guarding your shooters in the corner. Are you going to – are you going to help on these rolls? Are you going to help on these drives? If so, you're going to get splatted. And if you're going to take away that guy in the corner and there's a little space there, you're going to give up drives, or you, you're going to ball watch a little bit, and you're going to get on some back doors. Um, and I think uh, – you know, like and then you get a, a phenomenal passer like Ferrari's good, and St. Mary's had one last year, and Emmett Nara is good as anybody too. That they uh, they really exploit those. You mentioned Emmett Nara. We played St. Mary's last year. Uh, I'm curious. I'm curious what you think of our game plan. Obviously, as someone who scouted against them, so we 
guarding ball screens, we are the three guys who weren't involved in the, by the way, they, they killed us. They scored 92 points and like 1.4 points per possession. So it That's, didn't work out, yeah. but, uh, but guarding ball screens, the three guys not involved in the ball screen had no help responsibility. So we completely, uh, gave it to the guy guarding the screen to get through. And then the big just had to keep retreating, not let Landau behind them, but try to provide some support. Is that that's not terrible? I'm surprised you gave up 92. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I think it's, I think with him, his nature is to make others better. So if you're in rotations or helping, you're, you're he's going to carve you up. And but he's also his favorite guy was Londale. So if you're kind of playing them both one on one, you might be in trouble. Um, you have to find some way to not let him hit the roller because he's phenomenal. Right. I think I think it made sense theoretically. We had a small point guard who was guarding oh. there, so that that hurt us. He could she shot over him. We we made him a shooter. We you know, we didn't want him to pass. We made him a shooter, but he just he hit shots. Yeah, he can score. So it's like it's not what he wants to do. Doesn't mean he couldn't do it. He's a good player. So I think you're on to something a little bit. You're gonna pick your poison. There there were I think they're one of the most efficient offensive teams in the country. The last two years I think they have been so Yep. You, you, you might have been guarding them the right way, and they just, at home, they can, I mean, they beat us. They blistered us at their place. Um, and, and uh, you know what, I, I watched that film, and, like, we started off okay. And, you know, like, Krebs did, like, three bombs. Uh, you know, we were playing, and it's like, we got down, and then they just, they're, you don't want to get down to them. They're pretty tough. Puts a lot of pressure on you to score, and they're pretty good defensively, too. For sure. All right, so the next thing I want to talk about is your hustle stats. So sure. this this is a pretty analytics heavy podcast as is. Uh, um, definitely want to cover this. Can you give? I I listen to your podcast where you explain the system, but can you give a basic overview for the listeners about uh, what the hustle stats are in relation to how you coach? It's an attempt to quantify everything. It's the best way. <laughs> So giving value to everything we do in our program, everything that happens on the court, whether it's a loose ball, and a lot of people do it, but we, we really get down the details. Um, deflections worth something, a steals worth something, an on-ball coverage is worth something, a blown negative if you're in the wrong place, um, and uh, a lot of passing stats, and, and basically our own internal efficiency rating based on what we believe will help us win. And how is that determined? And does does that change from season to season, the the what you believe will help you win? Yes, we can tweak things. We've got to be careful and not to, because it's kind of been trial and error for about 20 years of doing it, different level, different things, and experimenting on what the values are. And, and always, and it's, without fail, when we bring someone new on staff, they'll always come up with, uh, something like we need to make rebounds worth more. That seems to be the one rebounds need to be worth getting the ball needs to work more. And I'm like, I totally agree. However, we've done that before and we eroded our whole integrity of our, our rebounding system. So, uh, so I don't mess with it as much. We shave it here, shave it there, always, um, flirting around with certain things, but, uh, you know, and we try, we got aggressive last year trying to help her get our, more, like I said, our offensive, uh, you know, with our offensive running, we want to create more opportunity for them to get more value of the passing and scoring. And, and we were horrendous defensively earlier in the year. So I was like, back to the basics this year. And hopefully we'll, you know, be careful. Uh, you know, it's pretty solid. It, it makes our program, to, you know, we're really just trying to get our, our, make us hard to beat by defending, rebounding, take care of the ball. That's the best way to describe it. In that podcast, you said something that I loved. You said when you incentivize something, you lose something else. You don't necessarily know what that is. But I've done I've done some research on teams that are really good on one side of the ball, so really good on offense, not so good on defense, and they return everyone the the next year. Yeah. And you would hope that they can get better on defense, the side they're bad at, and maintain the offense. But it's really, really hard to do. So obviously, yep. the coach all off season is emphasizing defense. They usually make the jump, but their offensive efficiency now decreases. No question. I think actually the first coach I ever worked for had 
had a great uh, old school. I'm still co- all the numbers are there. I'm still coach centric. Hank Egan, who's kind of started the whole getting guys in the NBA from the University of San Diego, he said your offense has to match your defense, which is unique in this sport. It's not football. You um, you have to have two way players, and if you have sometimes and they each your best player will impact the other four on the offensive end and vice versa on the defensive end too. So um, I think that's some of the deal. Uh, and I agree with you. Like you'll see some. That's where I think like the inefficiency in Ken Palm is so offensive centric. And I think coaches that I don't I don't like giving this one. They really study that. There's a few that I know that really look at that. And they're like, we should be good. We got the, you know, we got a 120-0 rating and a 22 usage. And I'm like, be careful. You, you might be putting out the worst defensive team you've ever seen out there. So there's some tricks. Um, but I think you're on the money there. Going back to the hustle stats, when the season actually starts, are you still incentivizing practice heavily? Or are the hustle stats now really the games? Both. Um we just don't have we don't practice that much during the season to be honest. We have maybe yep. one full tilt scrimmage situation a week, probably two, and then and then probably another practice. Because look, we're going to be playing Thursday, Saturday. You might be traveling Wednesday. You know, we will get into it. So Monday, Monday maybe some Tuesday, and, and and so it's just not a lot. So it's more games. It's developing young guys, using those the practice stats for guys that might be your eighth through eleventh guy. Like, hey, you got to get better. You know, work on these things. And and you know, and I think we're no different than other people trying to use some of those guys to help on the scout team stuff. And you probably mm-hmm. erode some of your fundamentals. But I think that's depending where your program is. Like, we're really young. I wouldn't do as much scouting stuff because I don't think it's as important. But now that we're older, I think getting our guys more prepared for things they're going to see uh, is probably more important than when we graduate. Some of these guys will probably go back to a little more fundamental and just concentrate on being good at what we do. And there's always that. That's the art of coaching, I think, is figuring out, you know, I always, I always go back to justice and mercy. It's like, <laughs> when, do you, when, do you, when, when are you really indicting them and when are you really giving a pat on the back? And that, that same thing with what you're working on and where your team's at. What's the average player's reaction to basically being like graded? Um, so every coach emphasizes things. The only difference with you guys is you have data behind that emphasis. So what's what's their reaction to the data? Um, the average guy, well, we try to get, well, ours is unique because we try to recruit on the front end and sell it hard so they know what, we, we really encourage them by saying, hey, smart wins, smart guys really love this. Smart guys want to be held accountable. Smart guys, <laughs> I kind of tell them all, they're all really smart. So I'm hoping I'm getting a smart group. So I, I, mean, I do sell it as like being a classroom. So we're probably skewed more guys than anticipated. But I'm still shocked by often by some guys that don't, the best The best teacher is still the bench. It's still like we get through the first scrimmage and didn't play. And, you're like, and he's like, they use it on that. And they're like, oh, well, they're kind of head scratching their head. I'm like, we publish data every day. <laughs> Say we're going to play these guys that do well on these areas, you shouldn't be surprised, you know, and, and the good sign is that some of those guys after scrimmage, they, they started taking more notice, you know, they start, Oh, this does matter. You know, it's like you recruit them, you tell them for six months, you educate them. And then what really gets their attention is not, not playing. So I was talking to Jonathan about this the other day, and I want to get your opinion on this. I actually think that the hustle stats are kind of the opposite of Moneyball. So we compared the recruiting part to Moneyball, but Moneyball is taking baseball, turning it upside down, trying to figure out what isn't being valued properly. The hustle stats are taking your system, what you have always emphasized, what you believe in, and quantifying them to the extent, basically. So have you ever thought about using all that data like miss box outs to actually look and see, well, how did, how did that at the end of the day affect our rebounding or how did allowing a guy drive by us affect our defensive efficiency? Something like that. I I missed, I think we lost the connection there. I missed a little part, but I think I got the gist of it is that, yeah, we'll, we'll even get more in depth on, on certain stats. Like I said, like the biggest ones, like defending on balls, like what's the right number on how many, how many times are you involved in the ball screen coverage? How many times when, when you're in it, are we successful at managing that? 
versus how many times you get broken down. I guarantee there's a hard correlation to uh, guys that can't do it. They just rip up your defense. Um, and it might only be it like just very, I don't know what that percentage is. Same on the missed blockouts. Like if we're, you know, a certain group out there, what's their blockout to missed blockout ratio um, and how they rebound as a team, you know. Mm -hmm. But the, the rebounding has been pretty fairly. I think we've done a good job there. And then we're defending the three. We've been the stats. I don't know. The yield pretty low return there, too, as far as the, not giving up too many of them. Um, there's certain things like that that we look at and see. Is try to find what correlates. Obviously, we want to eliminate stuff that's that uh, doesn't mean anything. But it's funny how sometimes you'll let you say, "Hey, that doesn't that doesn't impact." You can't compare values to what we value. That's what that's the biggest mistake I think. Like, like how do I get a point for getting two feet in the paint? Like a rebounding stat, and that's you know, and a made basket's worth four or whatever. I'm like, just don't worry about it because <laughs> just don't think too hard on this, man, because it's not really the same it's more the ratios because opportunity to get two feet in the paint on every shot versus your missed block out and uh because they're really different categories like here's your rebounding on total here's your offensive total here's your defensive total gotcha and that's just over time those values have been they become apparent right from all the experience i, I don't know i just know that we've had success i can't tell you i can't i just know when we tweak it Sometimes you're like, oh my gosh, we're horrible here. Like, bottom line is, I don't think the naked eye. We all think we can. I don't think the naked eye can d discern if we're rotating a tenth of a second quicker in practice. And you know, we all, I think we're all fooled by emotion and the rah rah. Like, hey, you know, boom, we're, you know. But you know, when you have it, that there is a connectivity. And I believe in that too. Like, we're all five guys are connected emotionally, but like the actual um, objectivity of how many times you know we're in that situation a hundred times. We do it right 92, we're really good defensively. If we only do it 85, we stink. And I think those are the margins, actually. Uh, and you can't necessarily see that as a coach unless, you, unless you're grading it every day. I totally agree that as a coach, just literally charting the hustle stats, there's value in there, whether or not you're using the numbers or not, but literally just systematically having to evaluate the system. No one knows, no one knows our individual players better because we do it as a staff. and We don't have the backbiting on who's playing uh, why are we playing this guy? Why, you know, that, that, that was really why we started doing it, to be honest, is to eliminate that part of it. Like you're just dysfunction. It's like you're wasted energy on trying to, you know, Hey, we're going to make this objective. And, and now you, the head coach has final say, but we're going to, we're going to try to empower our individual players and our team by like, Hey, you're, you have a big say on who plays <laughs> on how, you know, and I think that, and that's why I don't mind sharing it. Because I think it's a scary proposition for certain people to get in the profession. I did a little research on your three-point defense. I found the top 25 coaches at taking away threes since you started your head coaching career. You worked with number one on the list and number eight on the list. Who do you think is number one? Well, I got a cheat sheet, so I know. I can't fake it. <laughs> okay. Joe Scott. Shockingly, I was a little we defended I, I was shocked a little bit but yeah, I shouldn't be it's been a long time I shouldn't be I take that back I say it wasn't emphasized that much but that'd be that'd be highly inaccurate it was emphasized a, a lot um and uh when they were real and it's amazing because he's usually playing undersized um and playing his matchup zone uh and then I know for a fact we studied hard it was it cracked me up because I would do the Ken Palm stuff and look at I think it was a product of the hustle stat somehow and emphasis the way we defend or something in there because uh saint mary's in columbia well, we just didn't give up many neither one gave up many threes uh we're always up there in the top top there not giving up many threes and, and defensive rebounding we're pretty good usually you on the list are number 20 randy bennett is eight you would be higher there the your cit championship year in 2016 at columbia i think you guys gave up 38 or 39 percent of your shots were threes on defense that you gave up for your career you're 30.5 percent was there a difference in scheme that year yeah i think we were so terrified about i think we fouled a lot years previous and we really wanted to correct that and i think some of it was um we we're hanging on the we we're, were just getting stretched out like chasing shooters around and uh, 
uh, not much rim protection. So I think we really said, hey, we are going to try to protect the paint a little bit. I think everyone was driving us. And we weren't very big inside. We were super skilled. We, I always say we we're just fighting, fighting to be – if we're average defensively, we're going to be really good off, of team. Kind of what you said, like we were really gifted offensively. And we won, and I knew we were undersized, so I said, we, let's try to keep the ball in front of us a little more, pack line it a little bit. We had some pack line principles we worked on, um, which I think they do yield. Pack line does yield threes, no? It does. It does, yeah. Especially corner threes. If you drive baseline, that there's not re- the help is supposed to be off the corner in the pack line. Yeah, so I think that was we, – we, it was just we had a couple holes in there. We couldn't guard the ball either on just – we didn't have – we weren't, couldn't put any pressure on the ball uh, at the point of attack. And you know how many teams have guys that are good pick and roll guys and that stuff. We're just penetrators. So we provided more support. Um, and I think that, and like I said, we tweaked it. And that's the unintended consequences of what happened. Um, but I, it, it might have been the right play. It might have been the right. I don't, we were pretty good. <laughs> right, right. It was a good year. So like uh, we and and if I I always look back at that team because like we're a possession away from playing for the championship and Devin Kennedy hit a thirty eight footer on us to uh, <laughs> snatch snatch one from us on our floor but um, and I, I was just looking at like we were close and some things I said playing just play, I should have just played six guys that year I think we would have been we would have been great or not I was, I was trying to keep depth and defend I'm like you know what we had old guys. We should have just played six, possible seven. We're pretty good. The other thing I wanted to ask you about is the selection committee process. So ESPN, John Gasway had an article, and you were quoted as questioning why you need a committee in the first place. I wanted to hear your thoughts on that. I mean, it's pretty obvious. I mean, if you did the aggregate of all the computer analysis, let coaches vote, let media vote, Da, 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 you'd probably come up with the top 68 teams or whatever, the top 34 at large bids. It would be pretty accurate. Um, but it just provides the political animals that are the power fives or whatever. Whoever, whoever's agenda can get pushed in there if it's a meeting room of people. That's just how it is. And that's a bias. And that's obvious. So I, I don't think if we're looking for objectivity, then we've got some algorithms that can – it just won't produce the result that people want to see necessarily or what they think they want to see. And it's probably depriving some teams of some opportunities. And I think um, since the non power five teams had more success starting 10 years ago, when or whatever it was, when George Mason and Wichita state or whatever, who was it? George Mason made the final George Mason. Yep. Yep. They were the first, they're first. And then Wichita state and VC. He was 11 seed, had to play a play-in game. They got to the Final Four. So clearly, Loyola Chicago wasn't going to the NCAA tournament if they didn't win the Missouri Valley, which is insane. Illinois State, the year before, went 17-1 in that league. That league's good. And that's that's kind of a disgrace, uh, I think, for the NCAA. Like, I think the undermining the idea that what makes, I think, people's interest is that it's just true competition. And uh, the, you only need five guys. And little guys, if they get in there and get opportunity. Uh, good things happen, and, and that was Gonzaga 20 years ago, and somehow they they bully balled and turned themselves into one of the halves, and they don't. I don't think they have the same criteria as other non BCS leagues or non Power Five leagues, but that's good for them. But it's like let let's bring some objectivity to it, or figure it out, or what's the criteria before the season so we can prepare and coach that way, and and you have to be willing to step on some toes and some you know whether it's the TV people or whatever, but that that would be that would be, you know, that'd be nice. <laughs> if if you had your way, would you want the at large criteria to be the best teams or the most deserving? Um, well, I think they're one and the same. The distinction would be um, the best teams are most deserving, and the best teams based on objective criteria. So it's your best teams. I guess it kind of gets to like. How much do you want point differential to be in there? So, like, I, I, I think my thing is, hey, uh, Jeff Sager has a rating. Ken Palm has a rating. The AP has a rating. Like, okay, they're all a little different, but I bet if you took the aggregate of all of them, you're gonna probably get. That's probably gonna be the answer. That's probably or or whoever does the best job over or whatever it is. But people coach and 
they here's what makes me so angry. I think it was probably 10, 12 years ago. They said RPI is what we're using. We're going to be, and they stayed to it. And, and, and guess what? We, we were at St. Mary's and we were a top 40 team twice. We got two at large bids and we you know went to the Sweet 16 one year. Actually, we won, our, we won the tournament that year. But I think, I think the Missouri Valley had like four teams that were top 35 or something. And it was, oh, they juked the system. Blah, blah, blah. Did they? Maybe they did. Well, then honor what you said what you're gonna, the criteria was and throw them there and see how they do um, instead of that. So they just give themselves wiggle room to the eye test. Jay Billis want to talk about the eye test. Like, well, that's not how competitions are settled based on your eye. And, you know, the people say, well, you can just look at them. Well, if that was the case, LeBron James would never lose. He's a hell of a player. But why compete? He's he passes the eye test <laughs> like no other, you know, and that in the Warriors won 73 games without Kevin Durant. And I wouldn't say they necessarily passed the eye. Steph Curry doesn't pass the eye test. So what is it? You know, that's why objective data or something like that. I think we can get this day and age. And, um, there's there's ways and RPI is pretty I think is pretty archaic on it, it, there were sort of huge inefficiencies in it. But people figure, uh, you know, so something else have have some confidence it's probably better than human beings they're sitting there just fighting for their territory or their their constituency and not not playing fair well i had ken pomeroy on the first episode of this podcast and he basically said exactly what you just said so so there you go you're in good company i'm gonna be a fan obviously um and it just it's just kind of, i mean just people they wouldn't have anything to talk about joe lenardi would be out of a job uh <laughs> I love Lenardi, don't get me wrong, but but uh, whatever. Just that's just honestly, I think it's turned into that. It's a big deal. It's a money maker. The intrigue and the the same thing with the college football deal. If, if you know, they try to make it a reveal, you know, where the, the numbers are, which I, it's not bad. You know, I agree with that. Like it's, it's kind of you know, it, it's really eliminated the conference rivalries and playing for a conference title somewhat because everyone's just worried about how, who's getting in and. Um, I wish they'd have more emphasis on, I think it'd be unique too, if they say, you know, if you're sub 500 in those power fives, like, ah, that's not really, then you might be good enough. I don't know, but that's, that, that's not as interesting to others. I don't think. So the last question here, I heard through the grapevine that you're pretty anti-social media. It's become pretty prevalent, especially in recruiting in college basketball recruiting. So I, I'd love to hear. Uh, like a hot take on on uh, social media and college basketball. I don't know if it's a hot take. I'm really becoming a dinosaur. I'm sure, and, and I, I'm, I want to call a lurker. I look over my wife's shoulder. She follows stuff, and she keeps me plugged in. Without her, I'd be really lost. But I just think Twitter in itself, for it is, uh, it's really about the individuals. Like I just look at me, look at me, look at me, and we're we're selling something. Is like look at us, and what am I doing for others? What am I doing? And um, I don't know the, in the recruiting, it's, 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 it's kind of, you know, I, you know, blessed to have my 21st offer. Like, well, <laughs> the person that gave you your first offer doesn't feel too excited about that. And it's about, and there is a subculture of people are just counting offers and like, then nothing has any meaning. So I don't know. I'm, I'm more relationship driven, um, face to face. I think I tell our guys, Hey, we're going to learn how to, and I understand it's, a, a certainly something they communicate with, but I think it's really important. And let's be honest, I really think, and I don't want to get to it, but I think our political climate is influenced by it. I don't think we're used to dealing with each other. Like, we are going to have differences, and we're going to be able to talk to each other. Same thing in the, in the recruiting process. Like, I want to get to know you. I'm not, not, not your profile. Not your, I don't think, I think these are, these aren't realities. They're, they're uh, I think anyone would understand that the social media, your Facebook, again, like, what life looks awesome and when you can craft it that way. And it's like, that's, that's not reality. So, um, I wouldn't necessarily say I'm, say I'm anti-social media, but I'm like, I'm pro, I'm pro human connection. How's that sound? Human interactions. Pro human interactions, but also pro data. So there you go. Yeah. yeah no, that's what I'm saying. Like, well, that's what people think I'm, you know, I'm always talking about the, the analytics and I'm, I'm working that angle hard, but, I, but the big challenge when we're really good is like, we got to It's us against the machine. It's us against the numbers, fellas. Let's get to get like, and, and I'm still coach centric. I'm still spawned from some great coaches I work for at, at all levels. My high school coach, my college coach, the guys I work with in Division One, 
happen. Um, and it's that, and it's that, that we're connectors. I mean, we're teachers, we're educators, we're, we're human. We, we have to connect emotionally and, uh, and spiritually too. It's at times it's like, you just have to really be connected to your team to, to have a, to, to enjoy the experience. Um, they're not, that's why I educate my staff. Like they're not, they're not robots. I know we're given a number. We got to be cognizant that they're just getting overwhelmed with all this data and we can't treat them like that. We have to, um, encourage. And the one distinction that I'll make is the alternative to all this data and feedback is screaming at them and yelling at them. Well, right. And so like that has an effect as well. You know what? I, and I snapped yesterday in practice, which is unusual, but not very often, but I'm like, is we're going to get it in the film and and i do like the idea that uh a it's just an inefficiency to, to stop practice and screen and maybe there's a time you need to get their attention but i would rather correct with the their guys I'm, i like I said it's a classroom guys learned it a lot of different ways seeing doing writing hearing whatever auditory i don't know all the words i should know that from my teaching potential <laughs> days but but I, I just say hey we're gonna pick this up on the back side we're gonna give and some guys just like the numbers I'm just like hey give me the data but some guys, the data doesn't connect to them. So it's like, well, let's see it. Let's watch yourselves. This is what we're talking about. You got to improve on that stuff. So, um, um, yeah, you, I think you get the idea. Well, thank you so much for all your time. I really appreciate it. I think this was a, a really interesting conversation, covered a lot of topics, and, and thank you again. No problem. I appreciate it. See you, Jordan. Hand checking Michael Jordan, Scott Pippen, Tony uh, uh, Kukoc. Uh, uh,